Are video games too sexist? How about racist? Including some asking if the game industry is sexist. The games community is at each other's throat when talking about the subject of race. Racism in video games, the new norm? In some countries are responding to what they view as sexism in video games. The more time a teenage boy spends playing video games, the more likely he'll be to develop sexist attitudes. Too many games, they say, perpetuate a culture of sexism and misogyny. Can video games influence racial stereotypes? Saddle up, Internet. We're going there. In the war against video games, we learn that there's always something destroying society. And we learn that violence in video games had massive amounts of coverage and research over the course of 40 years. There was something to be said about violent media affecting the minds of people, yet it overshadowed the sexism and equality debate. But the attacks on gaming from feminists and SJWs have had extensive coverage in the last five years. Sexism and racism has been a topic of debate on the video game industry since the 1980s, although it never got that much attention back then. But as the industry continued to grow, and with the advent of the internet allowing anyone to easily have their opinions seen and heard, the issue of sexism, misogyny, and race in gaming started popping up all over media websites, game journalists, on YouTube, everywhere. The combined might of feminism, the social justice movement, and the idea of racial diversity and equality was enough to bring up serious questions on the ethics of the video game industry. Were some games made with racist or sexist attitudes in mind? Is this even a real issue? With so many articles, videos, and opinions floating around cyberspace, join me as I seek to understand both sides and settle this battle of feminism and SJWs versus video games. In order to understand a current issue, we have to look back at what potentially caused it. We can't just look at World War II and be like, eh, it's just a bunch of pissed off Germans wanted to rule the world and kill Jews. And that, children, is a complete summary of the Second World War. There's more to it than that. So to understand why feminists and SJWs have been attacking the game industry, we have to look back at the origins of that industry. This part might not be as entertaining or fun as the rest of the video, but god damn it, this is the most critical point of the whole issue. It's important to understand that video games are a business first and foremost, and any business worth their salt is going to identify the type of people that purchase their products. Then they'll market and advertise to appeal to those consumers, to the demographic. For example, my channel is entirely based around video games, which is why you'll never see me make a video on fucking leather belts or something. Leather belt? Ah! Uh. The target audience for video games back in the 70s and 80s was predominantly young males, teenagers, and back then arcades were tailored towards this demographic. As you can see in this archive footage of gaming arcades, the people playing them are almost entirely boys, teenagers, and a few adult males. One of the big breakthroughs in broadening the gaming demographic to women and girls was Pac-Man. Toru Iwatani, the creator, intended the game to attract women to arcades, and it was successful, spurning the sequel Miss Pac-Man. If the game industry only appealed to one gender, they're missing out on 50% of the population and money they could be making. A study done in 1982 found the percentage of male to female gamers was 80% male and 20% female, roughly. As the years went on, higher percentages of women played video games. Recently, a statistic has been circling the web claiming women make up around or more than half of the gaming population. But this statistic doesn't mean we've reached a point where gaming as a whole has an equal target demographic. Because what's really important is understanding which genre and type of games males and females like to play. I want you to pay close attention to this chart that lays out the percentages of women who play which genre of game. Notice that only two of the genres listed are predominantly played by women. I didn't even know what Match 3 was before this video, but it's a genre of game where you match three tiles. Yeah, there's a genre for that. So applying this chart to the gaming industry, it should be apparent why most games are marketed to appeal to men. 
By understanding how the target audience for video games has changed over the years and how it is currently, we see why video games were marketed and created with the male demographic primarily in mind, and how gaming culture has shaped into what it is today. Remember this fucking chart, because it is goddamn important. Are games racist? Yeah. Mario! That is like a stereotype that runs around inside of your Nintendo, man. This study showing that playing video games for Caucasian college students could result in uh, racist thoughts and behavior. The first scene is the black dude just getting his ass kicked. <laughs> Specifically by a white dude. Sometimes I believe the hype man. We mess it up ourselves and blame the white man. But don't point the finger, you jiggaboo. Take a look at yourself, you dumb nigga, you. What's happening to the video game industry right now has been happening to Hollywood and the film industry for the last century, though not nearly as extreme. The same complaint made against Hollywood is being made against video games. There isn't enough diversity. What in the hell's diversity? For movies, this had merit, as discrimination and inequality was rampant in the film industry. Don't get me wrong, it's important that games and movies have a unique cast of characters to represent different types of people from all across the world. A diverse pool of people can bring interesting perspectives to the table, but it's not as simple as checking off the black, Asian, and Mexican boxes for characters. This creates tokenism, which is when a form of art or a story specifically inserts diverse characters for no other reason than they feel they have to, not because it fits the framework of what they're trying to do. Ironically enough, when they do feature diverse locations or settings, they play the race card if there are or aren't representation for race X. As in the case with Left 4 Dead 2. What does Hurricane Katrina and setting the game in New Orleans have to do with one, one another? And what do they have to do with racist undertones in video games? Nothing. Now, I speak for myself, but I imagine most non-racist, non-sexist people would agree. When I watch a movie or play a game, I don't think to myself, Oh, hey, this has a black lead character. Oh, yeah, that's diverse. That's good. I'm more interested in the writing, the cinematography, the sounds, the music, dialogue, the character itself. Unless it relates to the subject matter of the story itself, I don't give a fuck about the color of their skin. I just want to be entertained, and if possible, see a culture or idea I've never seen before. See, the real problem is seeing a lack of diversity as a problem. When you boil down the quality of any art or narrative down to a gender or percentage of skin tones, you are making the diversity quota an issue. Take this stereotypical hipster. Also, some reasons as to why GTA 5 is actually objectively sexist. First up, reason one, three male leads. What? Objectively sexist? Okay, is Charlie's Angels objectively sexist? That features three female leads. What kind of fucking logic is that? You got three lead characters. One of them's not female. Boom, sexism. It's about discovering who your character is. And there's a lot more to that than skin color. And the same goes for gender, sexuality, religion, and all those other facets of diversity too. Some of the games that have come under criticism from a lack of diversity or racism will just blow your fucking mind. You get to choose what torture device you get to use on the random brown guy. So you can either electrocute him or waterboard him or pull his teeth out. It's like nice that you get to choose how to hate. The racism has shifted from overt caricatures to overt actual real world racism. Yes, some games do have stereotypes. But the mere depiction of a stereotype doesn't make a game racist. If you're playing a game and you think the characters might be racist stereotypes, ask yourself, is this meant to depict a greater image about the characteristics of an entire group of people? Is this just a simple, easy way for game developers to create diverse characters? Or is it just meant to be funny? The whole point of making fun of stereotypes is to allow us to laugh at ourselves. Every time white dudes pass out around each other, they always do some borderline gay shit when the guy's asleep. These racial characterizations are spot on again and again, even in some of the less prominent races. The Spaniards, for example, are portrayed as effete, beclawed homosexuals in colorful spandex, just as they are in real life. So when people get so butthurt over this kind of stuff, I think it's a sign of insecurity. It's only racist if it was made with racist intent, 
One of the most controversial was Resident Evil 5, which was based in a fictionalized part of Africa and had you fight against zombies with dark skin. Yet the way SJWs reacted to this, it seems to imply that we can't have video games set in the continent of Africa because doing so is inherently racist. The most recent game I've played recently was probably Resident Evil 5. The bad guys in this game, which are all just Africans with spears, literal spears that they're uh, chucking at you. It's in Africa. It's been in Antarctica. It's been, I think, in Spain. It's been in the Midwest. It wasn't racist then. Why should it be racist now? It's in Africa. Have fun with the game. Play the game. If location can make a game racist, then why isn't the Jewish community in an uproar over games that take place in Germany? And here's another question. If they made the indigenous people of the villages in Resident Evil 5 white, wouldn't you have still complained because the game was inaccurate and the developers failed to depict the people of the villages in a proper manner? Of course you would. That would be something to complain about. Take Witcher 3, for example, made by a Polish game developer, based on a novel written by a Polish man living in Poland who based that novel on Polish mythology and European folklore. Now, Witcher 3 came under fire and criticism because it features an all-white cast. You want to know why there aren't any black, Asian, or Mexican dudes in Witcher 3? For the exact same reason that African movies feature mostly African people. Action packed movie! <laughs> or Chinese films feature mostly, you won't get this, Chinese people. Because any piece of art is going to reflect the culture from where it originates. Remember when I talked about target audience? Demographics? Well, the majority of people in America are white while the majority of sexual orientation is straight, and the majority of people who play hardcore games are men. So if you use your handy dandy notebook and tally up the numbers, you'd see the reason why so many games have straight white male protagonists and characters is because that's a goddamn demographic. Well, I want you to guess the demographic of Poland. Just, just, just take a guess, take a sec. If you guess 98.5% Caucasian, you're right. Skin color does not define culture. And that's the point I want to make. Culture in video games is more important than skin color. I'll say this once more. Skin color does not define culture. But this article by Polygon seems to think otherwise. Reviews have lavished praise, perfect scores, and awards on it. While some reviews have mentioned issues such as sexism, none I read mentioned another crucial misstep. Not a single human in the game is a person of color. And it's tied to a central issue here that gaming as a whole needs to face. Concerns of minority groups are not only ignored, they're so often not even considered. Yes, according to Tariq here, representing people of color is an issue the entire gaming industry needs to face no matter what country you come from because fuck your nation, Fuck your culture, fuck your history, give me diversity, or I'll write a shitty, racist article about it. Almost every Witcher 3 review I came across was written by a white man. Who gives a fuck? Are you here to review the game or just be fucking racist? Historically accurate is another common defense for many awful actions in fiction. What? Are you saying change history for the sake of diversity? What fucking planet do you live on? This goes to show, no matter what you do, someone will be pissed off about it for some reason. So who would DICE rather piss off with Battlefield 1? Historians and fans of the series? Or a bunch of butthurt blathering babies that want to see history changed to include women in a war that they barely even fought in? Who would CD Projekt Red rather piss off? The Polish nation? The people in mythology of Poland? Or some fuckwit dingoes that care too much about skin color? Tariq Musa? saw a game gaining massive praise and attention, and he saw nobody talking about the lack of colored people, so he was like, b -b -b but what about people of color, you racist, you dehumanizing racist fucks? You want equality, dude? How many Polish video games are there that you know of? I guarantee for 99.9% .9 of gamers, this is it. This is Poland's video game industry. How many people of color have you seen in video games? Hundreds! So rather than rejoice, like this guy, in the fact that the Polish nation can take pride in one of their works being so critically acclaimed by the world, this backwards asshat of a man tries to self-victimize himself and disregard the nation of Poland. Obama doesn't even play games and he recognizes the accomplishments of the Polish people in making The Witcher, 
This article is a perfect example of how SJWs can get so wrapped up in their own ideology that they don't realize what they're writing is racist, culturally insensitive, and virtue signaling propaganda that attacks the very diversity it seeks to promote. I bet most of you watching this right now never actually thought to yourself, hey, I haven't seen insert skin color of person that isn't white in this game. You know why you don't think that? Because you're a normal fucking person that doesn't look and judge things based on color. Isn't that the point of equality? To highlight the fact that we are all equal, that we are all human beings, that skin color is irrelevant? If so, why does it matter what the color of anybody's fucking skin is? America has a big history with race because we are a very diverse country. But as Morgan Freeman wisely said, How are we going to get rid of racism and stop talking about it? Stop making it an issue. Stop trying to put race into every discussion, into every piece of media and art. Stop trying to make race an issue. People are so concerned about diversity that they'll write page after page, article after article. Why not just write a diverse story? I think a lot of these people spend so much time behind Twitter that they forget that they have two hands. They have a brain. They have the ability to create, to design, to explore, to imagine. They have all of these tools at their disposal. But instead of actually taking the time to put their money where their fucking mouth is, they sit behind a computer screen and complain. These types of articles are systematic problems of game journalist ethics, and the resort to clickbait and cause controversy around popular well-known games. Is there a lack of diverse people from different cultures as video game protagonists and in the industry? Perhaps. But it's not really an issue. That's just the demographics of America. Now if you want to change what video game companies appealed to, you'd need to change the demographics. And good luck with that. But it seems to me like these people want to change the way our culture and other cultures and countries create art to fit their own standards and ideologies of diversity and racial acceptance. And that seems far more damaging to society than a lack of diversity ever could be. Because the more you make an issue of race and color, the more you make race and color an issue. Despite the number of articles and videos I've gone through, it's hard to even understand what it is feminists and SJWs want. What really is the end goal or the vision they are seeking? Okay, so you're tired of seeing sexy women in video games. So you want unattractive women in video games. Why? You want unattractive men in video games? Why? It's art. You can make your characters look however you want. I feel retarded even having to say this, but people like things that are attractive. You want more diversity in the skin color of characters? Okay, how much more do you want? How are you gonna get it? So they want more women and colored people working in the industry. Alright, why are you not directing your articles towards the minority groups you want represented? Why aren't you trying to convince them that a job in the video game industry is something to be desired? There's a reason certain jobs are dominated by specific groups of people. Women just aren't as interested in engineering as men are. Is the engineering industry sexist because women aren't interested in it? Fuck no. People like different things and there is no perfect harmony of equality that can be achieved in every single industry across the globe. I'm constantly wondering what the goal is. An equal amount of men women, colored people, in video games, making games, playing games, and promoting games? Is that even realistic? It's hard to find a feminist or SJW that can articulate their points in a way that gamers can empathize with and still be somewhat respectable. But at least there is one, the factual feminist. Are there video games that are rife with sexism? Is that true? Do they promote a culture of misogyny and violence that must be dismantled? Well, my answer is no. As far as I can tell, there really is no tangible end goal for these people. It's all about pushing an ideology, conforming people to that ideology, begging for attention, clicks, views, virtue signaling. You see, so many of these videos and articles don't actually provide a solution or a means to get there. So it's just bitching and moaning. In the quest for diversity and equality, it appears what feminists and SJWs want games to do is pretty straightforward. 
More women in strong roles, ethnically diverse characters, protagonists, armor should not be lingerie, etc. I think that sounds reasonable, but looking past the surface value of these blanket statements and actually listening to what these people want becomes an indecipherable paradox. <laughs> There's so many layers of irony it's hard to wrap your mind around it. You can't portray women as victims of violence or abuse. You can't portray women as being violent or abusive. You can't portray women as sexy. Women in the industry can't can't portray women as being sexy. You can't not portray women at all. You can't portray a woman being rescued by a man. You can't portray black people getting killed. You can't portray black people killing. You can't portray any stereotype. You can't have a game set in the continent of Africa. You can't not portray people of all the different skin colors and genders, regardless of if it makes no sense within the context of the setting of the game. Would you like it if um, we only made games that were approved of by every single person on the planet? That's a good idea, huh? But if that were the case, I guess um, game production would stop in its tracks and no game would ever be made again. All right, well, if we listen to these people, what can we do? That's the thing, they'd never be happy. Because most of these feminists and SJWs are complaining about video games to an American audience, but then try to take games from other countries and apply American principles to those. What's that? Japanese companies are making games showing scantily clad women playing volleyball? Stereotyping people from other nations? Quickly, American principle card activate. Well, as you probably noticed, most of the people who criticize video game content for being offensive or problematic tend to be American speaking to an American audience. But since American studios are not responsible for producing so much of what gets criticized, it seems to me that any criticism that fails to distinguish between American studios and Japanese studios is deeply unfocused and unproductive. Ironic how the stereotypical American policing the world is trying to control what game companies from other nations put in their games. You're becoming the American stereotype that you don't want represented in video games. Yet you believe you own the world. That because you're American, your sense of morality is better than every other country. All these propositions from feminists and SJWs is just restriction. Silencing certain expressions of speech, which ironically is against American principles. And the most ironic part is all these feminists and SJWs complain about the sexism, racism, yada yada in video games. But at the end of the day, who do they expect to fix this problem in a white male dominated industry? Now there's nothing more hilarious in my book than when someone bites off more than they can chew and then blames the food when they choke. It takes a special type of thinking to believe you can attack and harass a group of people and call yourself a victim when they swing back let alone against a community of people that have been attacked by mainstream media, by politicians, by their parents, by just about everyone. That's what so many of these feminists and SJWs do, is constantly play victim, to the point that they actually make it a profession. After all, Rihanna Wu is making 40% of Barack Obama's salary for simply existing, so this harassment narrative is working quite well for them. But I'll take a note from Sarkeesian's book. When women constantly portray themselves as victims, it disempowers them because now they need to be saved by someone else, and they can't deal with the threats they face on their own. Coincidentally, I'll be discussing Gamergate as well. Look, nobody approves of death threats, but if you're gonna publicly insult and demonize millions of gamers and the industry they love, you can't act shocked when you get threats like that. These people didn't attack you first. You weren't doing anything, then you attacked them. Not to mention, you attacked them on the fucking internet. People on the internet are gamers. If you don't wanna be harassed, don't incite the wrath of the internet. Now the logic of professional victims is something like this. I'm sure this is a fallacy in some philosophy book. I am being targeted and harassed by many people of the side I am opposing. Therefore, you should take my side because you're an empathetic human and these barbarians are threatening me. You know, there's an age old saying, don't talk shit if you can't take a hit. You suck, Hulk Hogan, dick. And you fucking suck Hulk Hogan ass. This is why societies have their own form of checks and balances, right? When someone's talking shit out of their mouth, society checks that person so that they don't wreck themselves, right? But if the person is so arrogant and self-absorbed that they can't check themselves, they're gonna wreck themselves. 
There's also the famous story of the boy who cried wolf, and it particularly applies to the case of Brianna Wu. For those who don't know, Brianna Wu is a professional victim, and she's actually a dude. Real name, John Flint. Yep, she's a real fucking Frank Fontaine and a con artist who perpetuates harassment towards herself for personal gain. Now don't take this as a knock against trans people, because the point is John Flint uses his experience as a woman to justify his terrible actions and gain support through donations. With the amount of evidence showing this dude's false flagging, how he created accounts to harass himself, and narcissistic way of tying every possible tragedy back to him, it's hard to take any possible death threat against him seriously. And this is one of the spearheads of the anti-Gamergate movement. Why should anyone believe this death threat wasn't fabricated like the others? John Flint had brought on the wolves so hard so many times that now he's being harassed by people because he faked being harassed and is trying so hard to become a victim. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. At least death threats are exactly what they are. But this maliciousness is far worse than that. Purposefully inciting hatred, diverting police resources away from actual issues, all for the sake of what? Equal representation in video games? Or is it more likely self-gain? Then we've got Zoe Quinn, another con artist who once again takes on multiple aliases. Yeah, she did a little bit of porn here, but you know, that doesn't matter because her corruption and the shittiness of her character has been well exposed and documented. Like John Flint, she's got a shady as fuck background that if you want to know more, check the description for a link. Of course, there's Anita Sarkeesian, and fuck me if I'm going to spend any time dissecting that turd basket. But you know, people like this really make me appreciate Jack Thompson. Though an irrational, single-minded guy who was wrong about pretty much everything he said and did, at least he was straightforward, and sometimes actually had good intentions. He wasn't a fucking snake like these witches. He wasn't a self-victimizing cunt, just a dude fighting the wrong battle. Now the optimist in me wants to believe that many of these SJWs and feminists have good intentions, but people like John Flint, Zoe Quinn, Anita Sarkeesian, they just make me think like those people with good intentions are also doing it for nothing more than selfish personal gain. When you've got this type of representation at the top of your movement, it makes everyone else look like shit. And that's the real tragedy of these self-victimizing lunatics. At the end of the day, this was a war waged by feminists and SJWs. They brought the fire, but we had more fire. Any positive message that could have actually done some good in the world and in the game industry was hidden behind a mess of pathological lying, manipulation, corruption, hatred, and narcissism. This resulted in their attempts at making the game industry more inclusive and representing women more fairly utterly meaningless. Gamergate was successful, and the people that opposed it so fervently were exposed as the narcissistic hate-mongering bigots that they are. I'm going to briefly talk about some of Anita's videos, but more importantly how the greater message behind her work is inherently flawed and inconsequential. This brings us to one of the core reasons why the trope is so problematic and pernicious for women's representations. Whoa, 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 look Anita, you want me to get my fucking English teacher in here? Because English must not have been your strong suit. If it was, you'd know that a trope is a storytelling tool. The tale of how Crystal went from protagonist of her own epic adventure to the passive victim in someone else's game illustrates how the damsel in distress trope disempowers female characters. Okay, so does the wimpy kid trope disempower boys? Do you see anyone making a big fucking deal about Urkel? Does the dumb muscle trope disempower men, making them look unintelligent? No, it's a type of fucking character. So the damsel trope typically makes men the subject of narratives while relegating women to the role of object. This is a form of objectification because as objects, damseled women are being acted upon. What about Zelda? She's a damsel in distress and even in that role, she's the title of the game. Not only that, sometimes she fucks shit up. How about Bastila, who starts off as a damsel in distress? She's labeled as a prize, as a slave. But again, she fucks shit up and she's not a prize for just a male character, you can be a female character too. She even becomes stronger when she turns to the dark side and is still a damsel in distress at that point. How about Princess Fiona? She's a pretty badass damsel in distress. You see, you can't just take a single trope from storytelling and suddenly start to say that now its implementation in video games is disempowering women 
or a specific group in the real world. Why the fuck was it not doing that for the last 5,000 years? It's all about how the storyteller uses this trope, not that the trope itself is a problem. The hero's fight to retrieve his stolen property then provides the lazy justification for the actual gameplay. You know, at least I can partially agree with Anita here, because in many cases, it is lazy. But when the demographic is primarily men, they're going to naturally be appealed to this trope because they have that inner fantasy of rescuing a woman, of being a hero themselves. It's not about sexual objectification. It's not about the disempowerment of women. It's about overcoming a challenge, feeling proud of that, and saving someone. So while it is a somewhat lazy and overused trope in video games, it's not inherently sexist. It's all about what the storyteller or artist chooses to portray. There is no single storytelling mechanic that is detrimental to society or disempowers people. I appreciate the thought, effort, and research that must have gone into making these videos. I can really appreciate that. Games need to be fun before they can tell a good story. So I understand why games have a lazy justification. But this series is nothing more than an analysis of the damsel in distress trope in video games. All these videos that took $160,000 don't mean diddly dick if you can't prove or show some kind of point, which was your goal. But there's no proof that this trope is damaging. There's just hearsay. How could you even quantify the damage this causes? It's like that South Park episode Cartoon Wars. If you allow one group of people to dictate what is and isn't okay in storytelling and art, then every other group can do the same. Until storytelling becomes a stale art restricted only by what will or won't hurt people's feelings. All this does is advocate for restrictive storytelling. Try and think of the game development industry as a big clubhouse with boys only written on the front, right? Even if it's by accident, nerd culture does manage to exclude women and LGBTQ plus people in a bunch of different ways. We're saying gaming can no longer be this little boys club anymore. One of the biggest points people like Sarkeesian make is that gamers want to remain a boys club or that we don't want to include other people with differing sexual preferences or whatever. This is so far from the truth of what is at the core of the gaming experience, which is being an all-inclusive club. For so many years, gaming was looked at as a thing for nerds, geeks. The stereotypical 35-year-old man living in his mom's basement was paraded around as if it represented all of gamers. They used to get bullied for being nerds, and games like Dungeons and Dragons were a source of refuge for these people. They could enjoy the things they loved with other people that felt the same way, and not worry about being discriminated or made fun of, not worry about parents scolding them or what the news media was saying, to just have fun playing what they loved. The idea that we don't want more women or people of color playing or making video games is just absurd. That's why we like seeing hot women in video games, because we wish we had girlfriends that played video games with us. So no straight male gamer would ever look at a girl that plays video games as something bad. I mean, if I had a girlfriend that played video games, man, fuck making out, having sex and all that gay shit. Let's go play Halo, dude. Let's fuck shit up in Dark Souls. Let's play a Mario Kart drinking game. This flawed concept that gamers were harassing women because they're sexist and don't want them in the industry was the basis of the anti-gamergate position and the reason for their self-victimization, which is why Not Your Shield became a movement. Anti-gamergate was using minorities and women as a shield and saying that they were on the sides of those minorities. It's the gaming community that that has, ris that has risen up because it's been yeah. it's, it is tired of being lied about and slandered by its own press. Yeah. Realistically, unless you're playing Dota, League of Legends, or Call of Duty multiplayer, gamers don't care if you're gay, what color your skin is, or if you're a girl. All we care about is having fun and sometimes being competitive. <laughs> Gaming is a medium that people of all walks of life can meet and make friends online. People from different countries or with disabilities, social outcasts, you know, everyone can have a home in gaming if they're a good person at heart and they share their love with others. In fact, the world of games is rich and diverse and there's room for everyone. So why give young women this discouraging message 
that they're not wanted. So no, we don't want to be a boys club. We want diversity. We want to meet people from different countries, of different ethnicities. What we don't want is a social ideology infesting and restricting the hobby we love. Now let's wrap this up and talk real shit. Just as it was with the war against video games, the idea that video games and the industry itself is racist, sexist, homophobic, pro-genocide, or whatever, has no real concrete evidence or proof. It's the exact same problem as before. You got these studies that say gamers become more X after playing Y and answering the question Z. Because correlation always proves causation, doesn't it? Like this graph, showing per capita cheese consumption and the number of people who die by becoming tangled in their bedsheets. Or this one, which clearly shows that margarine consumption is directly responsible for the divorce rates in Maine. Because correlation always implies causation. Simply put, there are no statistics, research, or proof that could lead one to reasonably believe video games cause racial or sexist thoughts. And it'd be an even further stretch to imagine any sort of trope, stereotype, or lack of diversity in a video game having real-world consequences. Would-be game reformers need to connect the games they criticize to negative world consequences. They need to show, not dogmatically assume, that video games make people sexist. The burden of proof rests with them. Heck, even when Anita and Frank Fontaine went to the UN and wrote up a report on cyberbullying against women, the UN, after publishing the article, retracted it because the evidence presented in it was cited from bogus studies and discredited research. So if you're good enough to make it to the freaking United Nations and you still can't make a case, I'm sorry, but you're shit out of luck. And I can see the good intentions and well-meaning opinions of some of these feminists and SJWs, and quite frankly, I would like to see more diverse stories in games, different points of views we hardly ever see. I think there is a genuine value in that, that should be tapped by the gaming industry. I think you can be more diverse and represent women in a way that's good without having to cave to all the ridiculous demands. It all just comes back to what do artists want to do with their work? What do they want to achieve? And I think it's great when games put their characters in roles much different than what we're used to. It's always nice to see something refreshing that breaks the mold. Unfortunately, the vast majority of these SJW feminist articles and videos are just so ideologically driven and intent on changing the gaming industry. Rather than these people being passionate game makers that want to add more of what they want to see, they can't and haven't reached the gaming audience because of the way they articulate their points. It's a vicious cycle of complaining about X, but not actually doing or writing anything that would encourage people to change X. Then when these people's ideas are criticized, they hide in a shell, play victim, and soak up as much sympathy as possible, like a parasite. All while hiding behind the cover of saying, gamers want to be a boys club. It's non-productive, it distracts from real issues, and aside from getting a few laughs from these lol cows, it's just a waste of time for everyone. I'm sure tackling the discrimination of gays in Russia, or role of women in Saudi Arabia, is much more important than what color of skin or what clothes video game characters have. This quest for equality and diversity wasn't a highly publicized issue until just a few years ago. It wasn't an issue until it was made an issue. Until gaming itself was attacked. To summarize, I'll go back to that great quote from Penn. Yeah. To try to blame Shakespeare and the violence in Shakespeare and the violence in art uh, for violence that happens in the real world is something that's been tried for years and is always wrong. It really is as simple as that. Blaming media and art for violence, racism, or sexism has been tried for years and is always wrong. After Gamergate, many of these SJWs and feminists had faded into the abyss of obscurity. The views on feminist frequency were down, the PBS channel stopped uploading videos, and though some games and developers were affected by their ideologies, I believe video games will revert back to being the art form they were always meant to be. Yeah, someone sent nasty words on the Twitter. Can we get the FBI to investigate, perhaps? No, you know what's sexist? You know what's a tiring plot device? You, Anita. Something being offensive is entirely subjective. For example, your absurdly thick-rimmed glasses? They offend me. They, they offend me greatly. 
you're not actually bashing and killing and doing terrible things to women. It's a game. It's a video game. This totally proves that video games cause sexist attitudes. That's why there was absolutely no sexism in the world before video games.